Hey everyone, uh, so in this video we're going to be going over the basics of Unity, how we're going to download, install, uh, what the interface is like, creating basic scripts, uh, and a bunch of other basic things like that, as well as importing some assets from Maya or whatever 3D modeling program you use. And we're going to go over the asset store a little bit, and finally, uh, how to build your app as a standalone build for either PC, Mac, or, or whatever. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, what I have up here is the uh, Unity website, unity3d.com, and when you're downloading Unity, all you need to do is click at Unity. And, yep, there you go. There's all sorts of different things. You can click free download, and all you need to do is download the installer. And recently, Unity's made this really easy for us, so uh, when you open it, all you get is a couple different prompts, and it's very much the same on Mac, uh, if you're doing it on a Mac. And the important thing that you need to keep pay attention to when you install Unity is this page right here, which components of the engine you want to install. So you absolutely need this first one checked, because that is the engine itself. Uh, it is a good idea to have the documentation as well, and uh, you don't need the web player, but um, I'd go ahead and check that one as well for now. It's going to get removed pretty soon. Um, standard assets I would also uh, download. Uh, if you're on Windows, you absolutely need Microsoft Visual Studio Tools for Unity. Uh, if you have the option to not use Unity's IDE on Windows, you should take it. And uh, you want Windows, Mac, and WebGL. If you're interested in Android or iOS, I definitely go ahead and check those off as well. Anyway, when you hit next, it will start installing, and you just have to wait. You may have to click a couple prompts. Uh, I've already got it installed, so I'm just going to cancel out of this, and I'm going to open up Unity. Uh, you can open up however you want. I have a taskbar icon. Highly recommend keeping it in a quick and easy to access spot such as your taskbar. So, your when you open up Unity for the first time, it will not look like this. This will be empty. Uh, and what you're going to want to do is uh, create a new project. You can, you can come here, you can watch this little intro video. It's mostly just marketing fluff. Uh, you're probably already on board with Unity, I'd hope. So let's just dive right in. So, if you already have some projects, you can open an existing project, and actually, real quick about that, Unity projects are folders. So if you have, so I have a bunch of different, these are all Unity projects, and if I wanted to open one of these, I just need to click the folder itself and hit select folder. Now what you can also do later is you can actually open uh, a scene and it'll open up Unity for you, but we'll talk about that here in a second. So I'm going to create a new project. I will call this Intro Tutorial Project, and I like to save things in my local Git folder. It reminds me to version them. Uh, if you're familiar with version control, version control works pretty nicely with Git. Uh, I'm not going to go over that today, but maybe someday later. So. You go ahead and create projects. Something that you also want to look at are asset packages. And in here, you could import a bunch of different things. So uh, anything you've downloaded from the asset store, which is something we'll talk about later if you don't know what that is already, uh, will pop up in here as well. As well as a lot of uh, standard Unity packages like vehicles, utility. Uh, for now, we're not going to go ahead and import any of those. You can import them later. And uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit Create Project. And when this happens, you will see a bunch of different things happen. And then you'll pop up with the interface. Now, I'm going to make sure I have the default layout, since this is what you will have the first time you launch Unity. And there's a lot of different things that are happening in in uh, in the Unity interface. There's a million different tabs, and if you're familiar with 
quite a few programs. Uh, it's not a surprise then that I can move these around. I can dock them in different spots. I can resize them. Uh, and something uh, that m maybe is less obvious, but still, uh, you know, not groundbreaking, is that every single one of these panes has an options menu. But I find the icons typically pretty hard to find. But it is this guy right here. It's the hamburger button above each one. And it's important to uh, remember that this exists. There are sometimes features that you really only find in there. So <clears throat> uh, let's let's start talking about Unity as a whole, or, or, or maybe more basically game engines. So when you have a game engine, and let me let me go ahead and pull up uh, a note note taking program here. Come on. All right. So what's what's happening in a game engine, right? Like there there's there's game logic happening. So we have game logic. Uh, it's drawing things to the screen. What else is there? There, there's an editor, uh, and I, I actually find that the list of things that a game engine is, or at least what Unity is, is actually pretty small. It also just has a bunch of extra tools that make doing these things easier. So, you know, you, if you've played a game, right? Uh, there's always some sort of game logic running. Hopefully probably real time, though it can happen at specific points as well. And Unity is very much of the sort where uh, you have a constant frame rate and stuff's happening every frame. And uh, so then you have like a logic update and then the engine draws. So at a like, very basic level, that's really all that it's doing. Uh, but it has a really nice editor. Unity has an awesome editor. It is why you use Unity. So just to get started with looking at the editor, <coughs> the kind of like, I, I, I don't think Unity invented this concept, but one of its big innovations was the fact that you could have a uh, real-time preview of the game as you build it. So, you see the scene and game tab. So, if I click between these, this right now in the game tab is actually what the game looks like, more or less, in whatever I'm building for. So, uh, it tries to emulate that. And it won't always be 100% accurate, but uh, this live editing without having to compile a bunch of 3D assets is actually a huge benefit. So, anyway, getting back to the editor layout a little bit, I just mentioned the scene and game tab. We have a project uh, hierarchy here, and I'll blow this guy up a little bit. And this... I'm not a big fan of this version of the project hierarchy. You can see that it has your favorites, you can filter things through here, and then your assets folder is the main folder of your project. And so, as I mentioned before, a Unity project is just a folder. So I called this project Intro Tutorial Project, and now that I'm looking at it in my Explorer or, or Finder or whatever, you'll see that there are four main folders. There are Assets, Library, Project Settings, and temp. Well, temp is, well, temporary assets. Project settings is, uh, pardon the beep there. Uh, project settings is, <coughs> well, project settings. Uh, so there, there's a bit of metadata that goes with every project. Library is stuff that is generated that includes kind of like your editor layout and and a couple other things uh the two folders that you absolutely need to have are assets and project settings and if we talk about version control later we'll talk about that some more but the main folder that we're going to concern ourselves with 90 percent of the time well let's say 99 percent of the time is the assets folder and right now it's empty we have no assets so there are a lot of different things we can wind up doing with the assets folder but before we get to that let's just make something and play, okay? Uh, to make using the editor easier, I have a layout I prefer. So I mentioned that this uh, this project hierarchy isn't I'm not a big fan of. So then the options menu in the hamburger menu button, you'll see that there's one column layout. And yes, it makes it look empty. 
I prefer this, and it's not a big deal which one you want to use. Just know that they are more or less the same. This one will give you kind of a filter view, and this is a tree view uh, when you have things inside your project. So for now, we'll just leave it be. So uh, you also have a console, which when your scripts are outputting debug information or when the engine spits out an error, it'll come here. And I also like to dock that over here. Sometimes I'll dock it here so that I can see this window. Uh, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but it's a good idea to make sure that your console is always easily accessible when you get into debugging, which is the most common thing you will be doing as a game developer. Uh, at least most likely, unless you've figured something out none of us have. Uh, you'll want your console tab easily accessible. So, let's talk about Unity again for a second. Uh, a lot of game engines have different paradigms of how they're going to do things. Uh, Unreal, for example, calls all of its objects actors or pawns, stuff like that. And in Unity, they don't rock the boat, but they have uh, two, uh, a couple of vocabulary words, really. Uh, but two that I really think you should remember. There are game objects, and any objects that is in the scene not necessarily rendered, but any object that is in the scene is a game object. So you can have invisible game objects that are really just points in space. The next word that you should be concerned with is a transform. And a transform is a common data structure for games. And what it is is a collection of points. So this higher uh, collection of, sorry, data talking about where and what orientation the object is in 3D space. So in the hierarchy here, we have a list of all of our game objects. We've got the main camera, we've got a directional light. Uh, when you make a new project in Unity, this is what you'll see. You'll see a main camera and a directional light. And if I click on either of these, they will pop up in the inspector, which is this uh, pane over here on the right. So, uh, what the inspector is telling us is it's telling us the different uh, details about any given object. And let's go ahead and just focus on this top thing first, okay? The transform. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to minimize camera there on main camera. Transform gives you position, rotation, and scale. So if you've used a 3D modeling program, you're already familiar with these concepts. So over here in the scene view, and this is kind of the main 3D editor, we have a couple different icons. Okay, this camera, well, that's the camera. And this icon is the light. And uh, one of the most useful shortcuts for editing is the F key. Uh, it's hopefully you're already familiar with it in other programs, but you can just F something. It sounds a little silly, but uh, I'm going to focus here on the camera. And uh, all I see is this icon that's always going to face me no matter like which direction. I move around. So moving around in the editor is pretty easy though. Uh, if you hold down right click uh, while you're in the editor, you can orbit around the camera. If you're holding down right click, you can then use WAS or D uh, and kind of play like a first person shooter at that point. Uh, you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out and uh, you can use alt and left click to tumble. And another way to zoom is Alt and right click. Uh, so it's pretty similar to a bunch of different 3D programs. You can actually edit a lot of these. Uh, uh, bah. Where'd it go? Sometimes I lose my mind when I look at Unity. Uh, you can edit a lot of these things in preferences. Um, and there's always assets that'll change them. So, uh, but I, I'm not going to talk about this day. If you are interested in customizing your editor even more, there are a lot of good options inside preferences. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and close that now. Anyway, back to the scene view. So if I have the main camera and I F it again, I get focused on it. So the transform component is telling us where the object is, what its scale is, and what its orientation is in an Euler angle notation. That is to say, these are degrees so zero, if I wanted to flip the camera around, uh, I'd give it 180 degrees. Anyway, uh, so, um, but 
like any 3D program, I can move this guy around. And you'll notice that as I move the handle on uh, the gizmo, these these things are called gizmos, by the way. Uh, so this icon is called a gizmo. And you'll notice that in the scene view here, they have... Um, <coughs> Uh, they have a gizmo drop-down menu, and uh, you can go ahead and you can uh, disable some of these things and change them. Uh, it's unless you're like hunting for a needle in a haystack in your scene view, uh, you, you can mostly leave this alone. Sometimes you may want to make these smaller, uh, things like that. Um, if you don't want to see the grid, you could hide it. Um, but uh, it's, for now, we'll leave it alone. Anyway, so moving the main camera around, uh, yep, we can move it up and down, uh, left, right, and in and out, that kind of thing. Actually, I guess that's the x-axis. Uh, but <clears throat> this is something to kind of remember. So every 3D program has its own different uh, orientation of axes, and Unity has its own as well. Uh, so green is up, it's the y-axis, blue is, uh, let's see, what is it? I guess it's the forward axis, so it's the z-axis, and then red is the x-axis. So, uh, you can also pick this up and move it around at free will. I have almost, I very, actually very, very rarely move things around, uh, once I get them in the general location of what I want, uh, there's a couple different snappings you can use. So if you hold down V, there's vertex snapping. I have nothing to snap it to right now, but um, uh, once it's kind of in place close, I will often actually tweak the position ever so slightly. So in the inspector, I'm going to make this guy big again here, and you can see everything resizes. It's real nice that it does that. Uh, I can... If I hover my mouse over the X, Y, and Z components, you'll see how it kind of like gets this little arrow thing going on. So if I then move left and right, and you see it moves the guy. I just click and drag uh, in either direction, and it moves. Uh, this is a good way to uh, do minor adjustments. This is I tend to like doing it this way pretty often. Um, anyway, once that's happened, I will often round just to be safe. So of course you can click on any of these and you can type in the value you want. So that could be 2, 2.5, negative 8. And now I can hit F and focus on it again and it's not quite where it started but um, you know right now all we have is a camera. So there are other objects besides transform, sorry, other components is what they're called on in the inspector right now. So when I've clicked the main camera again, right, we get a list of all of the components attached to it, uh, as well as a couple other different things up here. But to finish going through the components, the camera has a transform component. Every game object has a transform component, and that explains its position, rotation, and scale. This also has a camera component. This is the component that handles this guy being a camera. So now, when I've got this clicked on and expanded, you can see that I have this preview box inside the editor, and that is the projection box of my camera. And I actually get a preview of what the camera is seeing down here. Super useful. There are a ton of different settings that you can change on a camera. We will probably talk about these someday later, but for now, we will leave it as it is. Uh, if you are an FPS snob, yes, you can change your field of view up to 90 here. Either way, let's just leave it at 60 for now. Uh, there are a couple other components. These actually do not have uh, any customizable things. The GUI and flare layer are kind of for effects and, well, GUI. Uh, the audio listener, uh, when we get into audio, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but the audio listener is the point in space that the character's ears are, so to speak. And if there's 3D sound, it will calculate it versus the source of the audio listener. So, uh, in addition, so some of these other things at the top, we've talked about position. There is rotation. So, uh, E is the hotkey for rotation. Uh, you'll also notice that there are a bunch of things up here. So this guy lets you drag the camera around. Uh, this guy is the movement tool. 
we've got rotation, we've got scale, and this is something that will only work with the 2D tools uh, and some colliders. Uh, so we'll talk about this one when we get to it. Uh, but we have the hockey is Q, W, E, R, uh, T, right? So W, E is rotate, and I can rotate this around. And you'll notice that the gizmo doesn't move with it. Um, again, this is an invisible point in 3D space. Uh, so moving this guy around, yay, super nice, I can scale it, and again, we're not going to see anything, uh, so we'll go over this again when we get something, uh, with it, something visual with it. Uh, so, okay, so the other things we have up here are tags and layers, uh, we'll talk more about these later, but the idea is, is you can tag things with different helpful descriptions, and then when you're coding, you can very easily access these tags. Similarly, layers uh, are also data, but the collision system inside Unity heavily utilizes layers, as well as the rendering system. So if I expand that camera again, this is like using render layers in, well, in virtually anything, if you're familiar with rendering. Uh, you can have your camera render specific layers, and coupled with the different rendering modes of cameras, you can do some really cool things this way. Uh, you can also get over some really common problems that 3D games will have. So, hold on a second here, gotta take a drink for a second. So, I'm gonna leave these alone for now. Uh, we will talk about tags for sure uh, at some point. And then, um, this icon here, this cube, you can uh, give, you can override the gizmo for your uh, point in space, for your game object. So I can make this blue. I could make it a diamond. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things you could do. I could actually make it an asset in the project. Um, and this asset picker, we'll see a bunch. We'll talk about it later. Um, but um, I'm going to just leave it this guy as none for now. Uh, so, oh, and then, oh, goodness gracious. The one other thing, you can rename your objects. So main camera is pretty descriptive. Ordinarily, you probably wouldn't rename this, but we could call this like camera one. And then you'll see that updates in the hierarchy. So I will control Z undo that. Again, we mentioned the project uh, window and then the, so the project is for your project as a whole. This is all your assets, your scripts. Now the hierarchy is for the scene you're in. So uh, the, thing we want to know about Unity then is the way it's architected, the way it works is you will have a scene inside your project and the scene can kind of be seen like a game level. It doesn't have to be one level of a game, but that's a good way to think about it. That's kind of what it's supposed to represent. So uh, you might have one level take place in one scene and then you'll have different assets in another scene. Uh, so a scene is the main sort of like editor window though. It is it is equivalent to like editing your MyASCII file, that kind of thing, or your blend file if you use Blender. Uh, so uh, if I look up these files options, you can see I can do things just like that. I can make a new scene, I can open a scene, I can save a scene. So I've got this guy already edited. I've, it's really exciting, you know, I've moved the camera around a little bit. So I'm just gonna save the scene and I will get a save dialog, and you'll notice it goes into my assets folder in the project settings, or sorry, in the project hierarchy. So I will just call this main scene and save it. And now you'll see I have a scene here in my uh, project hierarchy. And I can make a new scene, so if I hit file new scene, you'll see that I have a new scene and we have a new camera and a directional light. And I could save this guy too, and we'll call this scene two. All right, and now I can open and save these independently. Uh, we're not going to work on both of these. Just want to show you what scenes are early uh, because they are an important concept inside Unity. So I will go ahead and delete that. Uh, and to delete, you can hit the delete key. You can right click on any of these and you'll see that there are a bunch of different things that we have going on. So let's actually add something to the environment ourselves at this point okay so we have I talked about game objects and how that these are the main 
everything in the scene is going to be a game object, right? Everything you see in here, everything that has its own line, is a game object. So, we have a menu up here called Game Object, and we can create an empty one, and if I create an empty one, right, you see, we get a new hook, uh, we get a new set of transform controls here in 3D space. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention this, you can also hold Shift while you're moving around, and you will move around quite a bit faster. Anyway, uh, so when you create a new game object, it'll actually try and create it kind of in the center of your view. Um, what you want to do is, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to set these all to zero real quickly. And you can hit tab to bounce between them really quickly. So if I select this one, I can hit tab, then I can hit tab again, and then I can hit shift tab to go backwards. Uh, so if I F it again, I'll get back over here. It's a good idea if you're going to make an empty game object, always keep it at zero, zero, zero. Okay? And so a lot of editors will have kind of folders that you can use. And this is something that Unity actually doesn't have in its hierarchy. Now, the way you get around this is you use empty game objects. So I am going to make an empty game object. And I'm going to call this uh, geometry. Okay? And so geometry is just going to be empty. It's going to be at 0, 0, 0. Okay? And this will wind up being the parent for the geometry I add into the scene. So if this was an empty game object, all you see in the inspector is the transform components. I could add other components to it, uh, and like game object, there's a components menu, and there are a bunch of different things you could add. You could add a mesh, uh, and a mesh is actually going to be a couple components. There's a mesh filter and a renderer, and the filter is kind of the data, and the renderer is the thing that says, hey, draw this. There's physics. Uh, a rigid body is sort of the basic physics component. Uh, we'll talk about that more in depth quite a bit later. Uh, and then there's a 2D physics system, which looks almost exactly the same as the 3D one, but it's 2D only. There's a whole bunch of different uh, components you can add. There are UI-specific features, and we'll talk about those later as well. Um, again, we're really kind of only focusing on the basics. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this empty game object alone for now, and I'm going to make another game object instead. I'm going to make a 3D object. I'm going to make a cube. And, whoa, we have a cube. Really exciting. So, I'm going to go ahead and put this guy at 0, 0, 0. And, uh, this, I believe, won't be the case when you first open Unity, but you'll notice that, um, something's kind of going on here. Uh, I have a couple of these settings changed. So, um, what is going on here? That's strange. Anyway, um, I've only learned something new about Unity every day. I've never seen it do this. Uh, so what it's doing is it seems like it's moving around my handle for some reason. Anyway, um, you can change where the handle will be placed. And right now it's saying it should place it at the pivot point on the object, which should be the middle of this cube. Uh, and then you can... Um, uh, change if the tool handles are oriented in global or local positioning. So I can move this cube now, I can rotate it, and you can see that, yeah, it actually rotates. Um, and when I put it in local, this is actually really useful. So you'll see that the green, blue, and red arrows are now actually rotated with the cube here. And this is something that you should know about Unity's game objects. So I mentioned that the blue axis was kind of the, you know, kind of the z-axis in world space. Well, that's sort of true. So for each individual object, they have this concept of local space, right? So the local space is relative to its parent, which is its origin. What, you know, what is its orientation? What is its position? Things like that. So what you see in transform are the local are the local things. So this cube is like that uh, right now, right? It has no parent, so its origin is zero, zero, zero. So this is actually its absolute orientation. And if I move this guy, this is its absolute position. And all this is in meters, by the way. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. But um, so I have this cube, okay? And there is a whole 
mess of topics about kind of the unity way of thinking. And one of the most common things that happens with the unity way of thinking, uh, such as it is, is uh, parenting objects to each other, making them children, and then using their points in 3D space as important data for your game. So instead of doing fancy math to figure out where something needs to happen, you already have the point defined in the editor, so you just pick one of the points. So, the cube can become a child of another game object, and the reason I made the empty geometry object is because we will use this kind of like a folder. Okay, and the folder... Whoa. Uh, the folder... Um, geometry will just be an empty game object, and then I'm going to make the cube a child of it and I just drag and drop it onto it and now you'll see that we get a kind of a hierarchy going on here and so we see cube as an object and I'm going to go ahead and rename this cube, we'll call it um, companion cube, that will be very uh, fitting I suppose um, so now you'll notice that um, uh, n nothing's changed here and that's because geometry is still at zero zero so I, I move this around, right? It's still local space right now, but it's local space relative to the geometry. So if I went and I moved geometry around now, I unparented it, and then I moved geometry... Where? Where is it going? Okay. Oh, that's what I did. Interesting. Okay. Sorry, if you accidentally hit Shift-V, that's what this was. Uh, I will mention a couple times that despite having used Unity virtually every day for a couple years now, I still find new things all the time. I had no idea this existed. Shift V locks you in the vertex snap mode. Um, that's kind of funny. Anyway, so now if I parent companion cube to geometry, you'll actually see these values change. And that's because now it's local space is different, okay? Uh, think now, ge now companion cube thinks geometry is 0, 0, 0. All right, and uh, relative to this point in space, it's actually like this is its position, right? This is the delta. Uh, and now, though, okay. So what if I move this back to zero, 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 right? I'm going to keep it as a child. Uh, if you're familiar with 3D programs, this is not earth shocking, right? But it's uh, the cube moves with it, so uh, you know. Now, these values are the same, but the, compa the companion cube is clearly in a different spot. And now if I rotate this guy, right, the cube is in different things. So, like, you can make set up orbits and stuff like this. Uh, but the important thing to know is that if I made more geometry, I can make it a child of this geometry folder, this folder game object, this empty game object, um, and we'll call them folders. And then I can move the folder around if I need to. Uh, if I need to turn off all the level geometry, I can just disable this game object. And so at the top of the inspector, every game object has this checkbox, and if you click it, it gets disabled. And you notice, whoa, the cube vanished. It's gone. No, it's just disabled. If your parent is disabled, the child is disabled. That's not always true, but for now, we will consider that to always be true. Uh, so... I can toggle these on and off. Similarly, I could disable the directional light, okay? The thing that's giving light to this scene, and whoa, no more light. Well, there's still some light. Unity does use global illumination now by default, so we're still seeing some light from the ambience and the skybox and things like that. Anyway, I'll leave it on, though. Um, so, we have a cube. Cool. Alright. Um, now, now we have something to look at in our scene, okay? If I click on the camera again, you can see the cube has a preview. Uh, or, sorry, the camera has a preview, and the cube is very visible there. So, this is... This live preview thing I mentioned before is kind of like why Unity uh, was so cool when it came out. And it still is really cool. A lot of game engines are doing this now because this sort of paved that path. Uh... At any time, you can click play, and you can get a real-time preview of what it would be like to play your game with everything on. And that's what the game tab is, okay? So if I come over here, this is actually the same thing as the camera, okay? So any camera can be drawn at any time. 
Uh, and if I were to disable this, you'll see that there's no... Now it says the scene is missing a full screen camera. That's because there's no camera that was enabled to draw the scene. So what I can do is I can click play, okay? These are the different control uh, flow things you have. If I hit play, it will automatically go to the game window if you're in the scene view. And it may take a while. Um, all right. Anyway, so now it's running, right? You see these guys are blue. I haven't coded anything. There's nothing to do in this scene, right? So nothing's happening. I have a cube that's floating in space. Really exciting stuff. Uh, so it's hard to show you that these are actually working, but I can pause the scene. And then this button lets me go forward one frame at a time, uh, which can be really useful for debugging. I don't use this button very often, though. If there is two short, if there are two shortcuts that you should remember about Unity, uh, it is the shortcuts for play and pause. On Windows, it's Control and P. Okay, sweet. Now I'm playing. Uh, pause is Control Shift P, and then you can hit Control and P again to stop. On Max, just replace Control with uh, Command. Okay, so Command P, Command Shift P. Uh, I save so much time. It's really exhausting moving the mouse all the way up here, trust me. You get pretty lazy after a while, and you don't want to move your mouse. That might sound crazy, but trust me, it's true. Uh, so, we have this cube, alright? This cube's pretty sweet. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of this cube. Uh, again, I can, remember, I can move it around like this. I can position it. I want to try and position it uh, almost right in the middle of the camera. Uh... And remember, we move the camera into weird spots. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to move the camera to zero. And then I'm going to also move the Y to zero. Now I know anything at zero, zero on X and Y should actually be in the center of the camera. So, boom. And that's the middle of the camera. And then the Z is just the depth, right? So the camera is negative seven. I believe Unity actually puts it negative ten away from the origin by default. So I'll put it back to that. Um, and I have this cube. Sweet. All right. So let's make a little scene here, all right? I'm going to make another piece of level geometry. This time, I'm going to make a uh, plane, all right? And I'm going to go back to my scene view, and look at this, a plane. Wow, it is a flat surface. Uh, this is going to be the world's best game, right? Um, so I'm going to put in a zero, zero, zero. And look at this. It is right underneath the cube. I'm going to move it a little bit lower down to the ground. Actually, you know what? I'm going to move the cube up a little bit. And since I want to move it up, I don't want to be working in local space. I want to be working global. All right. And cool. So now if I look at this, uh, I'm not going to be able to see the plane, right? <clears throat> and why is that? Well, there's a good reason for that. The main camera is at zero, zero. A plane is completely flat. We are looking at the side of the plane right now. So if I rotated this guy a little bit. Sorry, which axis is it? Goodness gracious. This is... You go a little stir crazy if I do it like that. Okay, now you see the plane, right? Cool. All right, so I'm going to leave it like that, though. I'm going to make a flat surface. Instead, I'm going to move the main camera up, okay? And we're going to go up like this. See, now it's in view. And I can actually rotate. I can tilt the camera down a little bit. So now we get a nice little overhead action going on here. And now when I hit play, still nothing's happening. Okay, super exciting. So what do we want to do? Let's make this cube fall, okay? I mentioned before that rigid bodies are the main physics uh, component. And before I get too far on this, I don't want to forget, I actually want to add the plane to the level geometry folder object. So now if I want to move this around, right? Everything moves with it. Um, Again, I, I, I can't reiterate how important it is to get used to dealing with things in their local and world space. It will make programming this, your games so much easier if you understand the uses of that. And I hope I can highlight them as we move forward. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, back to making the cube fall. So in order to do collisions in Unity, Okay, everything needs to have a collider. And actually, all this primitive geometry we made already has colliders on it. The companion cube has a box collider. Okay? Uh, you see this green outline? 
that's the collider. If I go back over to the inspector, I can disable individual components. And you'll see if I disable the box collider, it uh, well, the green outline goes away. And if I bring it back on, uh, it's a little hard to see, but uh, I don't know if the recording will pick it up. But trust me, it's there. Um, as I mentioned, 3D objects have a mesh filter, which is kind of like the data. It's the mesh itself, and then a renderer. And the renderer is what links up the mesh filter as well as materials. And we'll talk about materials here in a second. Um, but uh, by default, these do not have physics components, okay? And there's a 3D collision system and 2D collision system. For the most part, they behave the same, okay? A box collider is more or less the same as a square collider, which is the 2D equivalent, okay? Um, and these colliders can be bigger than the objects, right? So if I change it now, you can really see that green outline. And this can be useful for a lot of things, right? If you're making a user interface, you usually want to make the clickable area a little bit bigger than the uh, visual itself. So you can do that this way. And the box collider is always pivoted to the center of the object, so you can change that a little bit, right? I can move it with the center point. Uh, I'm not going to talk about physics materials today, but it's worth looking up if you're interested in making your objects bouncy and things like that. So if we want to make this object fall, we need to make it a physics object. And to make it a physics object, we need to add a rigid body to it. And there's a bunch of ways we can add components. There's the component menu, which I almost never use. Uh, it gives you the sh control shift A shortcut. And all the control shift A shortcut is, is a shortcut for clicking this button, which says add component. And um, you will have a list of all the components, as well as all the scripts you have. That will not happen up here. So if you make your own script, the scripts you make will wind up being components most of the time. And you can either drag and drop them on to the inspector, or you can add them here. Uh, we're going to do scripts here in a second, though. So physics, OK? Right? we got all these different categories. And we want to make this fall, so we need to make a physics object. So we need physics. And I mentioned this before, but a rigid body is the main physics component. And so a rigid body is what's going to tell this box that, hey, you are a physics object. So now if I hit play, whoa, it's a falling box. OK, and uh, that's that's pretty cool. Um, you know, physics is awesome. Like, we're going to use physics quite a bit. And rigid bodies, you can change the mass of things. You can change its drag. You could have a physics object that doesn't use gravity. Okay, so I'm going to now play it like this without gravity. Okay, and it's not moving. It's not moving. Okay, so this is uh, I, this is where I think Unity like is the most powerful. You can change things while the game is running. Okay, and you can just test things. Like, what if I check this box? Okay. I can change any of these things at runtime while the game is running, and then, uh, you know, the scene will figure it out. Um, you know, de depending how you coded things, right? It just changing a trick box might not do anything if it was coded to do nothing. So if I check use gravity back on, the box is going to fall, all right? And that's pretty cool. Uh, I can then move the object back up, right? And since gravity's still on, it's kind of fighting me here. So that's weird. I'm going to turn use gravity off. But remember, gravity's off. It still has all those forces, so you can actually see the values still change here in real time. Instead, I'm going to turn on is kinematic, which means no physics. Well, not really. It just means stand still, kind of. Um, and then in runtime, I'm just going to I'm just going to move this guy back to 0 0 0. I'm going to reset its rotation. And, uh, I, you know, I can even go into the scene view, and I can lift it up, move it around, and then I can turn kinematic off again, okay, and then turn gravity back on. Cool. So you can start looking at your scene from different angles, see what's happening. Uh, you know, this is why some people will use Unity as like a pre-visualization tool sometimes. It's really powerful that you can do this. Uh, and like, don't, don't forget that you can do things at runtime. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, like, there are sometimes I'll get really busy into debugging something, and then I'll just remember, wait, I can just look at it while the game is running. Um, and let's say I really want to, like, kind of freeze frame this falling, okay? Um, hold on a second, I'm going to turn kinematic back on for a second. 
Uh, and by the way, kinematic sort of overrides everything. Like if you have gravity on it's kinematic, it's still going to be standing still. So kinematics on. Uh, I'm gonna. What I want to do is I'm going to want to kind of like freeze this. So I'm going to hit pause. Okay, and I could hit Control Shift P, but um, my hand was already on the mouse. So now it's paused. So I can still move around. I can move things this way. And pausing and looking at things is really helpful. So I can move ahead a frame at a time, though. And you'll kind of see how fast the object is moving through one frame at a time. So, okay. So, wow. Cool. We've got a cube, all right? And it is falling. So, uh... You know, we can add in more objects, all right? We got a cube. Let's make a sphere, okay? I will have that fall along with it. And I'm going to make this a uh, child of geometry. All right. And boop, boop. I want to add a rigid body. That's actually really useful when you can add a component. The last component you added will already be filled in. Um, you tend to sort of like add components to a bunch of different objects at once sometimes. Um, so you can also edit multiple objects at once, which is super useful, like super useful. Okay, so I can click on multiple objects, right? You have to ooh, hold shift and you can click that way. You know, holding shift sort of selects all of them along that path. You can hit control to select individuals. And you'll notice that components that objects share will stay. Okay, so um, the rigid body is still visible. But uh, you see this message components that are only on some of the selected objects can, cannot be multi-edited. It's the same thing. Like I can't edit the light property and the sphere and the sphere's mesh property at the same time because they're different. I have to edit those individually. If I had two lights, I could edit them at the same time though. Just like if I have two rigid bodies on the plane and the sphere, I can edit them at the same time. Sorry, not the plane and the sphere, the companion cube and the sphere. Cool. Um, and when you have multiple objects selected, right, like, there's cool stuff that's happening. Uh, I can rotate these guys. I'm not sure I want to do that right now, but uh, I can turn gravity on and off. Uh, if we have a toggle box, okay, and the two things are mismatched, you'll actually see it gets this little line. And then now they'll both be true, and now they'll both be false. So I turn on gravity for both. I hit play again, let them fall. Uh, whoa. What did we do? That cube fell perfectly. That, that probably shouldn't happen. There we go. Huh. Will that happen again? Well, that's cool. Um, anyway. Bit of a tangent there. Uh, anyway. Uh, so that, that that is something to know, though, right? Like, physics is not the most... It's a simulation, right? It's not like real physics. So it'll do kind of like weird things or things you might not expect, right? So now I'm putting these objects together and letting them fall. Woo. Okay, cool. We got a, excuse me, kind of a complex physics interaction going on there. Okay. So let's talk about materials, okay? So materials are sort of the, it, it's like adding, it, it's sort of the, it's the properties that define the texture, the, the color, and, and, a, and a couple other things. So, like, we're, I mentioned that Unity uses global illumination now. So, its standard shader has a bunch of other properties that the physically based rendering pipeline uses. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say global illumination, I should say physically based rendering. Um, so, things like how shiny it is, stuff like that. Um, so, let's color our cube and sphere. Okay? And uh, what do we want to color them? We'll make the sphere like red, I guess, okay? And so you'll see that this 3D object already has a material on it called default material. This is something we cannot change. It is the default material. It is the Lambert one of Unity, so to speak. Uh, but what I can do is I can make a new material. And materials are not game objects, okay? They are an asset. So I need to make them inside the project, okay? Uh, I can either hit them create here, or I can go up to this assets menu and hit create, and these are this is the same as this, okay? So I'm gonna create a material, and uh, that is this right here. I got a material, we'll call this sphere material. 
call it sphere mat, whatever. Um, uh, some people might argue that this is a terrible name, but uh, it's descriptive enough for our means. And I'm going to drag and drop the material onto the sphere. So now, instead of default material, we have sphere material. And you'll notice that the mesh render okay, has this materials thing here. This will actually tell you which of the materials you're using. If you have complex geometry, you can actually have multiple materials using different UV sets, which can let you make some really cool things. Uh, I doubt we're going to ever get to that. Um, but uh, if you need to check debug, this is a good thing to know, that sometimes the material might be mislinked for whatever reason. I'm going to go ahead and hide all these guys. We're just going to look at the material for now. So the sphere material, okay? I can change this here. I can change it on the sphere object itself. We have all of these different things. A material is a shader and then a set of properties for those shaders. So the standard shader, the standard shading model for Unity, okay, is what I talked about. It's the PBR thing. And all these different channels are the different things you can change. So I'm going to uh, focus on the sphere. I'm going to move it into the light a little bit so you can see some of these. All right, I can change its color, the albedo. Um, I can give it a, I can give it a tint here, right? So if there's no texture, it's just going to make it that color. If I wanted to add a texture, I'd add this. Uh, there's a checker thing. Um, well, that's probably not going to work or do anything meaningful right now. If I put that like gradient on there, you can see that it's colored it uh, purple in the spots that were white on the texture. If I change this back to white and don't add anything, I think I'll see. No. Okay. Well. Oh, that's probably is invisible. Anyway, um, like I can put a sprite on there, uh, and it's gonna look weird, right? This is UV mapping. Like your UVs need to be set up on your objects. So, uh, for the most part, for the primitives, you're just gonna be coloring these a solid color. So I'm gonna make this guy red, okay? And now this won't change anything, right? This is just the physical, or just the visuals of it. So boom. Okay, we got a red, red, red sphere. Pretty cool. Pretty dope. Um, something, I, I mentioned that a material is an asset and not a game object, and that's important, okay? I mentioned that you can change things at runtime. If I change the position of the sphere at runtime, right, it'll just keep updating from wherever I put it. And then when I stop the scene, right, these go back to where I had them, right? Because you're designing level. You don't want these to, like, you don't want to play the game and then... I mean, it just wouldn't make sense, right? Materials are different. They're assets, okay? If I change this material at runtime, uh, it it should stay the same, right? See, now the sphere's blue. And this is actually helpful most of the time with materials. Uh, it's not helpful all the time, so you just need to be aware that... Uh, Virtually everything you change at runtime will go back to the way it was before you hit play. And that can also be a problem. If you're changing things in your scene that you want to be permanent, do it one at a time. So that way you can lock it in place. Uh, otherwise, when you hit play, you're going to lose it all. And if you don't remember everything, you're going to lose your way. So to illustrate that, you know, if I actually wanted the sphere to be over here, and I wanted the cube to be over here, and I wanted the plane to be like this right this is gonna go back and if I didn't actually want it if I wanted it the way I had just set it up uh, I'd have to redo it uh, <clears throat> so anyway materials are um, let me change this back to none okay materials are uh, uh, really important there's so many different things uh, if you already know what a normal map is right that's the channel for that comes in here I can change how metallic the object is how smooth and this is all just uh, with Unity's PBR, okay? Uh, this is a this is kind of a complex topic, and we're just scratching the surface of it. But materials are really, really powerful, specifically shaders, okay? And you can swap the shader. So there are different. The standard shader will, for the most part, satisfy all our needs for a little while. Uh, but there are different shaders. There are like mobile-ready shaders. Uh, before the PBR system was in place, we had just st like diffuse shaders, okay? And you can notice that now it doesn't have all that shiny goodness happening. But um, this is a solid color, and this is totally a valid way to make games. Uh, so if you open up other projects, old projects, uh, 
you know, they may be using those shaders. And it, it's just something to watch out for. Only the standard shader has this really, like, neat little interface, okay? Um, and for you artists, hopefully these terms are already uh, somewhat familiar to you. Uh, if not, we can talk about these later as well. Um, so, uh, let's make another material for the cube, okay? And, uh, man, when I'm doing the same thing, I, I can make a new material, right? Uh, I do want to show you guys what it's like to create something outside of Unity for your project, okay? This is not how you import assets. And this is actually a bad way to do things. You can copy and paste things, right? So if I make a copy now, and I call this box material, okay? It's very, very important that you go back into Unity and let these things be imported before you do anything else. So you see that I added something new to the assets folder, all right? And now box material shows up. Um, so, uh, all I did was copy and paste, right? Um, and, uh, uh, I got a new material. So, the reason this could be a problem is you can have assets with, like, different properties, things can get mixed up. You typically don't want to manipulate assets inside this, uh, inside your, um, operating system. Uh, whether it's Mac or Windows or whatever, uh, you want to do it here. Uh, it, it's a little annoying. There's no copy, copying, right? So if you really just want to make a new asset with most of the same things, you can copy and paste. Uh, just user beware, okay? So um, you'll notice that I can't actually move these around like I can in the hierarchy. So folder organization is super important. And uh, before I get to that, I'm going to change our box to blue, okay? And I'll just... I'll drag this on top of our cube. Actually, wait, the companion cube's like white, pink, isn't it? Well, close enough. Okay, anyway. Um, folder structure, super important. One of the most important things, okay? Uh, you have, this is why I started with making this empty object, right? Because you want to keep everything organized. You want to be looking at only the data, only the objects you need to at any given time. So, okay, so, I'm going to make a folder for materials, okay? I can make folders, all right? And I will call this one materials. And now I'm going to drag box and sphere material in there. Cool. I'm going to do the same thing for scene. Okay, I'm going to make scenes folder. Sweet. All right, great. We've got a scenes folder. Now, this is just easier to manage, okay? If we need to find materials, we can go to the materials folder. And I'm going to pop back over to the other layout here for a second just to show you how this looks now. Right. This, this is kind of why I don't like this one, uh, this view as much, is because uh, I, it takes me an extra click to actually look at everything. Uh, but it does let you focus on exactly what you want a little bit more easily. And you can search for assets, okay? That's what that little search dialog is for. So I can start typing in box, I can type in materials, and I'll get uh, whatever I want. And if I click on it and then clear the search, it actually will move my cursor to the, to the thing I selected, okay? Uh, you can search by type. You'll have a bunch of different types of things. So if I just search for materials, you know, this actually fills in the string. So if you want to search by type, you can hit T colon, or you can do this and then, you know, delete what you want. It's important to be able to search by type if you want to find all your scripts, or if you want to find everything of a, you know, whatever. You can actually do the same thing in here, okay? You can do the same thing in the hierarchy. So uh, I think rigid body, okay? If I search for all rigid bodies, it'll do this. In, in the uh, scene view, you actually, if you just type in the name of the component uh, fully, right? So if I delete one, it won't be there. Um, it'll still find it. Super useful. If you're like, okay, where are all my physics objects? You can do that. Um, so uh, searching is super powerful. 